Hey folks, today we have a new leader in the automotive industry. But, unlike some of the leaders that you folks are experienced with dealing, was a mechanic first for almost 10 years before she got the opportunity where she's at now. She's now an assistant service manager who's already involved in growing her leadership skills at conferences, seeking out mentorship and growth opportunities, which means great things for the team that she's leading. It's Brooklyn Morse on the Wrench Turners podcast. Brooklyn, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day and sharing a little bit of your life with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So as you folks know, this show is all about the life, well-being, and productivity mechanics everywhere across the globe. We've got like 35 countries, hundreds of thousands of views now. I'm very thankful for you all to tune in. But the reason why I think the show has been so successful at this point, I think in, in my personal bragging view, is that we've kept it the same. We've got four questions that we ask everybody that comes in. doesn't matter whether a mechanic or a leader or a vendor. doesn't matter. We ask the same roughly four questions so that we have control. So if you want to go back and look at 150 plus episodes, uh, sorry, 70 plus episodes of interviews, 150 episodes total of our panels and our coaching and so on and so forth, you're going to find answers to the same questions. And many are similar and some are quite diverse. So the first question, as we always ask Brooklyn, is what got you into the trade? So I was actually in culinary for two and a half years before switching into automotive. So all of my friends growing up, high school, middle school, they all loved cars. Uh, my family's full of engineers. So kind of tinkering, just having fun with things, just was always in the back of my head a little bit. Uh, got into culinary. I ended up going to college for it for one semester and ended up getting out. And with all of my friends in college, new friends, they all were also in automotive and kind of encouraged me to take the Honda PAC program in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And I ended up getting in with my parents' full support and just absolutely fell in love. Just took it by the reins and went. So it's interesting that you went from a hands-on to a hands-on, but it was a different hands-on. What was yeah. the, is there something that you could suggest relates the two where it's like they're very, very similar or is it? Or is it the fact that they're both a lot of yelling, a lot of swearing, a lot of cussing, using your hands and getting dirty and getting covered in stuff? I mean, that's definitely part of it. Um, the The biggest thing that I found to be similar, which actually surprises most people until you really think about it, is attention to detail. So doing the same thing repetitively over and over, making sure that everything's exactly the way it's supposed to be and identical across the board is mm -hmm. the biggest thing that kind of translates back and forth. But I think it really gave me the, the patience and attention to detail with uh, automotive as well. Awesome. Yeah, it, uh, we say this on the show all the time. It's the boring stuff that makes us the money, right? When you go to a restaurant, when you go to a restaurant and you order the same dish because you love that same dish, you want that same dish to be that same dish every time you go into that same restaurant over and over again. The peas yep. have to be the certain size, shape, and color, and the cucumbers need to be cut just so, and the tomatoes need to be just just that ripe that you like it, and so on and so forth. The same thing applies to automotive. If we don't take the wheels off the same way and put the wheels off on the same way and check the brakes the same way and do the brakes the same way, do the really mind-numbing, boring shit over and over yeah. again to make people coming back for that consistent experience, we lose them. Absolutely. And it's, it's the same with oil changes. That's, that's what gives you the reliability with your work as well to make sure, okay, now I, I definitely know I tighten this because I put my wrench back here. And mm -hmm. little things that you learn from mistakes as well. And then that just really kind of makes you sound in mind, I think. It, it definitely worked for me over the years with the small mistakes. Awesome. So with that in mind, let's let's dive a little bit deeper on here. Mistakes is something that a lot of young mechanics are afraid of. Yes. They're afraid of making mistakes, whether it's in the kitchen or in the shop. They're afraid of making mistakes because they they're fear they're going to they're going to get sued or they're going to get fired or they're going to get yelled at or whatever. Mistakes are a way of business. The only way that we we learn successfully, I think, is to make mistakes. Now, like we're teaching my son, we want him to do dangerous things cautiously. You yes. learning how to do wheels, you learning how to do old changes are, in fact, dangerous things for them to learn to do. So we need to learn, teach them how to do those dangerous things cautiously. What would be one thing that you learned as, shall we call it, a young apprentice, that you learned early that was from a mistake? Jeez, that is, that's actually a really good question. Um, I almost have to think about that. 
the there's no mistake that I can really think of that was just like that big eye opener for me. Um, it was definitely just slowing down and watching other people and just really watching the mentor that was next to me at my first dealership and just taking the time with him and seeing how he did things that helped me honestly avoid a lot of mistakes. But it was, I've had a string bolt before and then I just started keeping the wrench in my front pocket. So then that way, if it's in my front pocket, I know it's loose. Mm -hmm. Then doing brake jobs, I always put all my tools away at the end because I'm just very meticulous. (laughs) And then that helped me kind of make sure that everything was tight. So it was just, it was small things that I learned from other people too to really help me. But I don't, thankfully, I don't think I had any major mistakes in, in my 10 years. Well, that's awesome to hear. I like that little tidbit though. That That's a nice little, it doesn't have to necessarily be that thing because every mechanic I, I know has some kind of process that they've developed over time that helps them prevent mistakes or prevent failures or things of that nature. Knowing that you haven't tightened the drain plug because the wrench is in your pocket, not away, is a really, that's, that's a really easy thing to overcome complacency because it's, I do the thing, I put the tool away in yep. that circumstance because you know you're not going to use it for anything else during that particular job. You do the thing, you put it away. If you haven't done the thing, it's in your pocket to use. That's a really cool trick. And that concept can be used for lots of things. That same basic concept for now, obviously on a big job, you can't do that. <laughs> like if you're doing multiple things, you can't do that. But simple things where it's very easy to become a complacent, that kind of thing can work. To that next step then, because you had a, you, you transitioned from the kitchen, as it were, into the shop, and very hands-on, very attention to detail, very loud and noisy and boisterous and dirty and nasty. What's the thing that occurred through your first year? Did you get put through the the ringer as many share experiences of like they got they had to shovel shit and they'd take up the garbage and get <laughs> coffees, or did you have the same experience as one of our you know, 10 mil mastery men are Richard Mueller, who basically got thrust into doing engines and diagnostics within that first year. So I think I had a different experience just coming out of the Pentech, uh, out of college at Pentech and the Honda Pack program. So with graduating with that, I actually graduated um, 80% of my like in training modules done and 100% of self studies. And self studies are just something that you take online. Mm-hmm. Um, which kind of gave me an edge overall getting into the industry. Uh, but my, my first year in college was actually pretty hard. The guys that I went to school with were phenomenal. I, there was no sexism. There were no problems. I'm still pretty close friends with a handful of them today. But uh, being a girl, I only knew I knew how to drive a car. I knew how to put my spare on, but that was like the extent of mechanical knowledge I had. So no one wanted the girl that didn't, that barely knew how to do an oil change, that didn't know how to rotate tires. So instead, I just sat down at home and I did my modules. I studied, I worked hard in that aspect and did everything to try to get ahead instead of just kind of sit there and sulk and be like, oh, this this obviously isn't made for me. I just kind of lit a fire under my ass and I really wanted to get it. Yeah, that's that, that ability to drive yourself to training I don't mean the literal drive down the street, uh-uh. <laughs> but I mean the the self drive to do the training is a really big key to success in our industry. Like I, I bring up, I haven't talked about it in a while, but the wrench turners data survey, uh, the wellness survey really exemplified how much more productive we as mechanics can be. The more training we get. Now there were some out there that, say, including my, my close 10 mil group will say that it's very common for the more you learn, the less you earn to come out. That is a result in personal opinion and a little bit of data, a personal opinion that it's more contrived about leadership than it is about the learning. The more you learn, the more you should earn period. End of chat. The more your base knowledge is, the more your base income should be period. End of chat. If your leadership is not paying appropriately based on your education, that's a different story. So to bring out the data specifically, the thing that all of you listening and and watching should remember that if you are working for a brand, doesn't matter, Honda, Acura, Toyota, Chevy, Mercedes, it doesn't matter. Okay. Data is across quite a few different brands. I think I've got 
13 different brands and 30 different stores. Anyway, that isn't as important as if you have your level three complete at that brand, you should be making at least $80,000 a year or more as a mechanic. If you are not making $80,000 a year or more as a mechanic, look at your training. Do you have your level three complete? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then look at your income. If you've got your level three complete and you're not making 80, what are you doing to make sure that you are? Is that because your base income isn't appropriate to your training or is that your level of input? Your level of input will absolutely change your level of output. The Absolutely. work harder mentality where some people say, well, just work harder. It's flat rate. Not always feasible. But again, level three, you should be making 80 grand a year or more in the U.S. With just, that, too, it's, it's really important to what they taught me early in college is try to like and love what other people hate doing. So I love doing interior work. I love doing electrical work. And that what is what really got me to where I where I am still am. Mm -hmm. And no one else wanted to do it. No one else likes doing the warranty work. That was just a challenge for me. So that challenge is I want to get it done in under book time. I want to do it better than everybody else. I want to be more efficient than everybody else. And that's what helped me make a good income to make sure that my family, well, my pets are all happy and healthy. So because I think that, that applies to everything, not just our industry, right, Brooklyn? It's find yeah. the thing that nobody else wants to do get really good at that thing and if nobody else wants to do it you can charge a lot more to do it the same thing yeah. applies in the shop if nobody else wants to do trim it's like hey mr service manager mrs service manager i really like doing trim <laughs> no one else wants to do trim i've got my level three in trim would you like me to do all the trim yes yes okay here's a blank check that you need to sign <laughs> More of the time, something set now. Obviously, I'm being a little bit ridiculous and and over the top here, but believe me or believe it or not, in some circumstances, things like that, that's not outside the normal. But you have to be good at it, and you have to be trained at it in order to yeah. do those kinds of requests. Now, to that extent, if you liked doing the trim and you like doing the electrical, what's your favorite trim to do? Uh, harnesses so dash harnesses and even floor harnesses that stuck are not necessarily fun to do uh, being five three helps so i can walk around inside of vans uh you can't stand up straight but i can walk around inside of vans and uh i just think that the how meticulous they are and how everything's laid out and being able to take that much apart and put everything back together perfectly not missing any screws anything and it just, it feels so good. Anyone can do an engine, but I mean, floor harnesses are hard. So all those Don't modules. Say that and... Anyone can do an engine because we've both seen the result of people who don't yeah. know how to do engines do engines. Yeah. But I agree with you. And it's, what's interesting is that in, in doing engines and suspension, you know pretty quick when something isn't going to fit or isn't fitting right or doesn't go where you're trying to put it. Like it's, it's usually, you haven't usually torqued things down and went, that's not supposed to go there because it literally doesn't fit the space because it's so very mechanical, so very metal, so very whatever. When you're talking about harnesses, you can make a branch of wiring go down a specific path and not know for an hour or more that you've made a mistake and have to literally undo everything you've done back yep. to that point. I've, I've done that. So doing a full wiring harness on an ATV, you'd think, well, it's an ATV. It's not that big a deal. Doing a, a wiring harness on a, on a snowmobile, it's not that big a deal, right? It's not a car. It's not like seven large pieces into a large 20-foot car. Believe it or not, it still takes four or five hours to do. And the last uh -huh. thing you want to do is get four hours into something and realize that you started, you completely screwed up something at the beginning. Yeah, that's the worst. So, yes, get good at something that, that nobody else likes to do. So that to that point, you've got like a decade on the shop floor. Yes, I do. What's maybe one or two, one or two things that you can recall in the last 10 years of basically working on Hondas, if I understand correctly? What's the what's one or two things that you can pick out were like awesome moments or super challenging things that you had to learn where it wasn't necessarily like in the book learning, but it was like experienced 
hands-on, you're only ever going to learn it hands-on. Um, real life backseat on cars, so electrical backseat where there's a loose ground. Um, that's always fun to learn and generally the hard way. Um, there's, it's hard to think of everything now. It feels like there's so many life experiences and the harnesses have always been my favorite. Uh, my first harness I've ever done was a huge learning experience. And the one that I did was a uh, dash harness before harness and seven control modules in an odyssey a brand new odyssey that honda was trying to figure out what was wrong with it and they're like well you got to do this and i was like okay um that that was a learning experience <laughs> but that also started the love of that just because taking everything apart was just so intriguing and watching how uh, water leaks do, which everyone, everyone hates doing, um, watching how water can interact with electrical components, causing the craziest things to happen. Mm -hmm. And fixing water leaks too has always been something fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, there, I, I've had a lot, of, a lot of really good experiences and with the new super tech, or not new super tech program, but being a super tech and really getting, I think those experiences kind of weigh the most for me and sitting down and talking to people like engineers and other very high level Honda technicians and learning from them and their crazy experiences, how something plastic can make a metal noise and just the most bizarre things on the face of the earth is just so amazing. What was your first experience? Now, sorry, let me, let me be a little bit more mindful of the question because I'm not intimate with Honda's uh, repair procedures and special service tools. My relatable part is at Chrysler and at Mercedes, they have full NVH kits. So you have listening ears yeah. with chassis pieces along with um, – and Mercedes was even better at this. They went to the next level. They had a box, like an NVH box that you could order. Now it was crazy expensive. But in the box came like seven different lubricants uh, between you know plastic to plastic, <laughs> rubber to plastic, leather to plastic, different kinds of plastic, and so on and so forth, along with varying degrees and shapes and sizes of felt materials to prevent noises and so on and so forth. Does does Honda have the same kind of thing that you use for NVH? Uh, we have similar things. So all of, we don't have a big box that's just set for NVH. We it, just small things. So we do have like chassis ears. Um, and we have like ultrasonic ears in general, but it's like a wand that you just put wherever and then it kind of picks up on it in your headphones, which is kind of nice, uh, mm -hmm. especially for wind noises. Mm -hmm. And we have belt tapes, like an assortment of belt tapes, but all of that we can kind of get independently. But it, it still does a job, gets it done. Awesome. That was one of the things that I think mostly between a bit of the TISM, a bit of the ADHEA, ADHD, which I found out is actually TDAH in French, which means that when you have an ADHD moment, you can say "tada" and still be right. Um, I digress. But, I like that. <laughs> uh, when you're doing noises of any kind and water of any kind, it's so easy to go down the wrong path. So very easy to go down the wrong path. And then you end up losing your shirt and diagnostics. What's something that you can share with with regards to water leaks specifically did you figure that you need to do every single time which isn't necessarily in the book I'll get the story from the customer every single time I get the story from them it can be the angle that they're parked at if they're only on an incline at home or a decline at home then water's going to get in at a different point um high pressure <sighs> water isn't always the best thought but a five gallon bucket of water is going to do you better and uh, I can't remember what the spray is called, but we've used it for um, finding oil leaks inside, mm -hmm. like, cases. Um, so I will use that for water as well and, like, tailgates and whatnot, and then I'll take it outside, stoke it. So then that way, if it's really high up there, then you can see where it's coming from. Awesome. That's – I like that right there. We always say – we always. That's a little bit too general. A lot of folks like to blame it on the advisor, and sometimes the, the advisor is doing their very best to communicate everything the customer has said, and it does need to be on the work order in some capacity. But there's only so much 
that a, an advisor can write, no matter how great they are at communicating and then subsequently taking what's verbal and being and writing it down. But water leak, talk to the customer. Yeah. Because sometimes, it, like you said, maybe the driveway is on a decline and that's not something that they communicated to the, to the service advisor. Maybe that's a little tidbit that you, you folks can take away. It's like next time you get a water leak, talk to the customer, ask them, is your driveway on a decline? That's not something that's not something that I would even think to think of as somebody who doesn't specialize in them. I've dealt with water leaks in the past. I remember doing Grand Cherokees when they leak like a bloody sieve because <laughs> yeah. as soon as as soon as a uh, of of dust would get in the um water channels that would drip down um front the front water channels, as soon as you get a lick of water in there, they would just plug leak and water would come in. Yep. And of course they're stupid far back and they're stupid difficult to get to. We would just pressure wash the top and it wouldn't leak at the front. It would come at the back and drain properly. So we would never get it. But not until we find that they would sit slightly on a lean or slightly on a decline or things like that would we find. Anyway, I digress. Water leaks, not my specialty. <laughs> uh, five gallon bucket will do better than pressure wash. For those of you that are listening, might be very, very useful. So now we've got 10 years of time. What led you... And what was the reason why you decided to go, okay, I've got 10 years under my belt now. I've You've spent most of your time at Honda, if not all of your time at Honda, I could be wrong. Yep. What made you want to become leader in some capacity? Because you're now, you're, you're now an ASM at a store. Yes. Um, it just seems kind of like the next logical step for me. Uh, I've always been intrigued and have been an open ear to the managers that I've had in the past and my last dealers. And I've done my best to understand from their shoes why decisions are made the way that they are. Um, and the, the position opened up. I was the highest that I could possibly be for American Honda. And I just wanted to kind of take wherever the next step was. And I've always mm -hmm. loved helping customers. I was kind of pushing for a foreman role. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then this ended up coming up and said, I still wrench a little bit, so I like that. And mm -hmm. it does it, it does me well. Awesome. What would you say is the the one thing that contributed the most to you getting the position? Uh, I think my personality in general. Um, I tend to be an empathetic person, probably to a fault. And having a, a woman there to talk to other women, especially that feel like they're being taken advantage of and just having me sit down and actually break it down for them, knowing cars and just explaining every ounce of this is how the air comes into the engine. This is why there's a misfire, just something to break it down and then compare it to something in their normal life that I think that was a big part of it. Um, I've okay. always been a little customer facing and have helped multiple times before. So I, I think they were just comfortable with me making that move. Now, did you have a lot of a lot of customer facing stuff that you've done in the last ten years, or is that something that's come on in the last couple of years? Or uh, the more so, a couple of years. Uh, my last dealer, um, my last two years there, I was fairly customer facing, where a majority of what I did was diagnostic complaints. So test drives with customers was very common. Anytime there was any customer related issue, I generally ended up getting involved. And I'm very grateful for that, but it just okay. didn't end up working out there. Okay. Now to that, to that end, because you spent a lot of time in the chair, as it were, with the customer, um, we'd like to tell technicians that they need to learn to communicate better um, without a whole lot of actionable insight to it as to, you know, steps. Um, I do my very best to publish content about communication and how to improve communication. I've done the Sweater Leader uh, webinars to try and, help technicians learn about anxiety and stress and, and learn how to coach their teams around them so that they can communicate better to be more observant and, and mm -hmm. learn how to communicate with the customer even better. What would you say is, is something that's occurred in the last two or three years that you've learned by the sheer seat time with customers that allowed you to be a better communicator with the customers, which sounds like played a key role into you getting leadership? Just shut up and listen. <laughs> Beautiful. That's, that's so, all it is. It's all everyone only wants to be listened to. I've had is in the last couple of days, especially irate customers, just yelling, screaming, 
uh, or quiet yelling if we're sitting in the waiting room. And I just sit and listen. And I'm like, no, I understand. And I'm going to make it better. I understand people have told you that before. And I live five hours away from my parents. They've told me of terrible dealer experiences. <clears throat> and I've told, I tell all of my customers that this is the last thing that I'm going to let happen to them because it happens to my parents and it, I can't stop it. But it's not mm -hmm. going to happen to you. So just really making them know that you're listening and just sitting down with them, even if it's not a bad experience. And then just joking back and forth about something that's going on in their life. Just everyone wants to be listened to. Everyone wants to be heard. Just take the time. There's, mm -hmm. You have no time limit on patients like that. So the cool thing here is the key skill that you need to learn as a mechanic in order to get to leadership is to shut up and listen. The key skill that you as a leader need to learn how learn what to do in order to be successful as a leader is to shut up and listen to your team. Yeah. And the key skill you need to learn as a service advisor to be successful in the service drive is to shut up and listen. There is a common thread here, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to <laughs> shut up and listen. We need to ask yes. better questions and we need to listen to the answers because that is the number one complaint of mechanics across the board is that they don't feel listened to. So as assumptively... If mechanics, all of us, don't feel heard, stands to reason that those around us probably don't feel heard either. Yeah. We probably don't listen well enough. So if we listen better, talk less, ask more questions, we're more likely to get better answers, get, have better customer experiences, and make more money. Awesome lead in. So this is, this is, this has been awesome. <laughs> what is your one piece of advice then? Because if leaving that off the table, because that's an awesome piece, leave that off the table. You've got yeah. 10 years. What's your single greatest piece of advice for mechanics who have got 10 years in similar to you, who've got lots of brand experience similar to you, who want to take the next journey to leadership? What's the best next step for them to be happier, healthier, more productive and become a leader? Uh, mechanics are notoriously negative. They always find, no matter what happens, and, it, and it, this goes for a lot of people as well, they, people tend to just magnetize towards negativity, always find the silver lining. It is always there. And that has gotten me so far in life. It's kept me positive in dark times. And it, I, that has always been my best piece of advice, is just, just find the silver lining. It's always there. You, know, you get your ass kicked by some job. Okay, well, it's not going to happen again, because now you know what it is. You just take that step back, find out what it is, no matter what it is, and just lean on that because you need that. Awesome. Always find the silver lining. Awesome piece of advice. Caitlin, it's uh, – Caitlin, I'm going to have to edit that. <laughs> Close. I have no idea why I said that. Brooklyn, it's been awesome. Thank you very much for your time. That's been mic drop after mic drop. There's so many tidbits in there for so many to listen to. I just – I can't thank you enough. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. You're very, very welcome. Folks, that's the end of another Wrench Turners podcast. Um, we're just bringing them to you as often as we possibly can. There's going to be a little bit of changes here going forward. We're going to be focused a little bit more on family, friends, work. So, folks, watch out for them. Keep tuned. And we're going to leave you with a quote like we always do. We always got to leave with a quote. And I found this earlier I had to modify it a little bit because it wasn't quite right. So this one's a little bit modified by yours truly. And I think it fits even better with today with Brooklyn. A leader with a worn pair of boots or an eloquent speech. Which one would you rather follow? Let you think on that one. Remember, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. Beauty.